All right. Well, we have we have a good group to get started here. So I will um, um, welcome us all. Um, my name is Debbie McDonald. Um, Susan, if you want to start, we are going to record this. Um, so Susan, if you want to start, we're ready to go. Um, my name is Debbie McDonald, and I'm a co-chair of the BSA Stuff College and University Roundtable, and I want to welcome everybody to uh, this event. Uh, this is a, a BSA SCUP Knowledge Committee, but it's also co-sponsored by SCUP and the uh, North Atlantic Regional Council of SCUP. And so uh, our intent, as many of you know who have been to uh, BSA SCUP events before, is to share content that we think is relevant and uh, informational to our institutional clients. Um, and I want to welcome also Nyusha Arndt, who is a co-chair of the committee, and Donna Denio, um, some of our committee members you'll see uh, later on. Um, but this is a three-part session, so it's a bit of a marathon for some people. Um, you're welcome to stay for one or all three sessions. This is a topic that is uh, critically important as we come out the other side of COVID, and we wanted to explore both from a, a personal health and mental health perspective, and also from a building health perspective. Uh, so the first one is, real, is with healthcare professionals, and then we'll have an engineering perspective, and then a case study of a building that is then using tenets of healthy building design to develop a new building at Lehigh University. Um, if we were in person, often this would be a case study and we would be at a building on campus. And since we couldn't do that, we wanted to share, um, you know, some uh, nice example of something that's, that's very relevant. So for this first session, I want to welcome Paula Buick, who's a, uh, has a, been a nurse practitioner and a healthcare planner currently with Answer Advisory, and Diana Anderson, who is an MD. Uh, she is a consultant with uh, Jacobs. Um, I will moderate. I will turn it over to Diana uh, to begin our presentation. We will take questions um, after. Uh, so if you have questions for, for either of these folks, uh, feel free to put those into the chat. And, um, um, and we could, with this group, also just raise our hands after. So we'll see what makes sense. So Diana. Great, thank you, Debbie. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. So I thought, so I, I'm a physician and a healthcare architect, and I thought what might be fun is to talk about health in the higher education space, but take lessons from the healthcare space, which is sort of my wheelhouse. So a lot of what I'll be showing today are some acute care examples, but I think uh, hopefully you'll find it applicable to higher education and campus health and planning. Next slide. And, you know, this is an interesting, relatively new hospital in the United Kingdom, a children's facility. But what's interesting is they really developed it as a, as a campus, as, an, as, as a healthy campus. And as I was thinking about what lessons we should bring from healthcare over to higher ed, I think healthcare could actually use some lessons from higher ed itself. And we're talking a lot about trying to develop healthcare campuses these days, long-term care campuses, moving away from just the acute hospital building. I just thought that was an interesting parallel to start with. And you can see the wonderful building sort of rising up from the, from the ground. It's very green. And I think that's sort of a great um, aim if we're going to create healthy buildings. Next slide. So the six sort of overall lessons that I think I'll touch on in the next 10 minutes or so is trying to convince all of you, or maybe I don't have to, that the built environment is a determinant of health. I took a course in medical school on determinants of community health, and we did never touched on the built environment, but certainly COVID has brought to light how important buildings are for our health. And I think I'll convince you even further by using data-driven design and give you some examples of empirical evidence of how buildings affect our health. Touching on technology, super important, especially now. And then design equity, which we're starting to talk about a lot more because I think we're realizing certain inequities are being built into our spaces in all areas, not just healthcare buildings. And then make a plug for thinking about space alongside our operational care models, but also our education models. One cannot work without the other. And then I'll end on this idea of planning for resilience as an alternative alternative to planning for infection control alone. So next slide. I always think about health in this way, and I, I try to convince my clinical colleagues all the time how important planning, architecture, and design are in terms of our health. 
Next slide. And if you go back in history, there's actually some interesting um, intersections in history where d design and health do sort of bump into each other and combine. And this was the 1800s asylum here in Massachusetts. This doesn't exist anymore, this building. But what's interesting is a physician developed the idea. Dr. Thomas Story Kirkbride said, we can treat people with mental illness in facilities that are placed in nature with sunlight, ventilation, fresh air, and lots of land. And I think it really speaks to the importance of having one of the users assist in the design process. And the next slide, we skip ahead to the early 20th century to the tuberculosis sanatorium. Uh, thinking about not having antibiotics for TB at that time, so the building was really the form of treatment, and the Altos building designed everything from the building, but also the sinks, the chairs, even the door handles with infection control in mind. And I see a lot of parallels to thinking about this example now with COVID, where we don't necessarily have any disease modifying therapies at the moment, and we're trying to use everything we can to fight infection. Next slide. This is an example of the Maggie's centers. Again, healthcare, these are in the UK. A few of them are in Hong Kong. They're designed as psychosocial uh, oncology care homes. And this is Frank Gehry. So many of them are designed by some of the well-known architects. Their principle is to develop architectural atmospheres going beyond the bricks and mortar to think about the space that the solid materials are framing. And it's really meant to recreate care and the building needs to act as a silent carer. And I think that's an interesting idea, not just for healthcare buildings, but for all buildings, education included. Charles Jenks, who commissioned these buildings was an architect. He said in a speech once, and it really stuck with me that he felt architecture was so important that it can even help prolong our life. It's that powerful. Next slide. And so I put up this slide a lot in my lectures to clinicians to try to illustrate the gap that we can sometimes see between the design intent we have and the final user experience. And I always talk about campus planning, the idea that you, know, you can plan where the buildings are located, but you might not wanna pave all the paths right away and really understand the user experience. And you can see here users have taken a more efficient path than they perceive with the actual planned path. And the next slide sort of shows an example of I think how important it is to think about design intent and user experience. I'm a geriatrician and I'm doing a, a year in geriatric neurology. So I think a lot about older adults, long-term care. And I think there's a bit of a gap. We design nursing facilities to think about keeping people in their room, keeping them safe from infection. But when we think about the end user activity, older adults spend much of their time view, viewing, watching, and observing the streetscape. That's a really key activity. I would argue that's a key activity in an education setting as well, where some of the time needs to be in your own little bubble focused, but a lot of the time is watching, viewing, and interacting, and how can the space facilitate that? Next slide. I think also in terms of laboratory and scientific buildings, I love this example of the Salk Institute and just click once and you'll see a little quote come up. Thinking about the fact that the lab bench, oh, I guess it didn't, but I'll just say it then. Uh, technology <laughs> snafus are always fun. Um, you know, thinking about the actual lab bench as the most important core space in the lab building, but Louis Kahn actually felt that bringing the scientists out was equally if not more important into social spaces. And you can see those wonderful blackboards where people have come and discussed. And the quote that was on there was from a, an architectural journal that says 80% of scientific breakthroughs happen in social settings, not individually at the lab bench. So collaboration is key. Next slide. So those are sort of supportive examples where I think we can get a disconnect sometimes, at least in healthcare. And it'd be interesting through question and answer, maybe to hear from the group about examples they've seen. This is a hospital unit in San Francisco for older adults. And you can see the floor it's quite shiny, right? It's reflective and it's striped and probably a, a very um, good design intent to design a pattern floor. But if you ask any clinician who works there, the neurologists, the nurses, the physicians, they'll tell you that the older adults, and you can see they don't come out of their rooms. And given changes in aging to depth perception, color contrast, this floor is perceived number one as wet, so it could be slippery with all that reflection. And two, the striped pattern is often interpreted by those with dementia as 3D. So this may look like a staircase and that's pretty terrifying. And so that original design intent, while 
wanting to do good actually may end up doing harm. And so how do we bridge that gap? And I think one way is that hybrid link, having people who have expertise in both and can really translate some of that information back and forth. Next slide. Nature and windows. I think others probably will touch on this. Paula may touch on this after I'm finished uh, with my slides, but evidence-based design started out in the 1980s, really emulating evidence-based medicine, whereby in clinical care, I never think about a prevention or a treatment without turning to the evidence. And I think we're moving in that direction with design. This is an example of windows. You know, the original 1984 study showed that if you have people recovering in hospital rooms with windows that had nature interviews, they recovered faster, did better, took less pain medicine, all around positive. This was a patient in the intensive care unit that I had worked in in New York City who had no window in her room. And when we moved her to a window bed, she improved. Not to say that this is a great study, it's just an anecdote, but the care team, the, the providers were very excited about the evidence. And because of that, they used the built environment in their care plan that day. Next slide. And, you know, I hear all the time, well, technology uh, is important, but we can't have windows in our buildings because they're too big. Campus buildings, hospital buildings. This is an example of a technologic solution to maintain circadian rhythms in an emergency department. This is a virtual window. And I think remembering that technology can be integrated early on in the design process. Next slide. So I said uh, design is important as a determinant of health. I'll also argue that it's it's, it should be seen as a parameter of care as equally important as the medication you might take in a pill form or a vaccine in your arm. The built environment matters that much. A few examples to highlight that. Nursing home, plate, table settings, dining room settings, lots of monochromatic food, white fish, white mashed potatoes, white plates, white tablecloth. This group of researchers did a simple study and said, what if we replace the white tableware with high contrast red tableware? And a challenge with dementia patients is not eating and drinking very much, and that can affect their health. Look at what happened. They ate and drank significantly more just by the simple design intervention of changing the table setting color. Design equity. So thinking about decisions that we make that can serve all stakeholders, I think is really key, and COVID has highlighted that. I, I would hazard a guess that you think if you ended up in an ICU, any room you were in, you would have the same level of care. You may get the same level of care from staff, but the room matters. This doctor did a study because he noticed that the corner room patients he was treating did worse, and he wondered if the building was responsible. So you can see that the corner rooms have poor visibility down at the bottom left, 4% visibility. And so the study actually proved that sicker patients put into corner rooms had higher morbidity and mortality rates. There are inequities in our buildings for healthcare and probably others. Next slide. Sink placement and hand washing, no brainer. But again, data-driven design is important. This group of researchers at McGill University quantified it. They found that for every additional meter someone has to walk to a sink, they're less likely to wash their hands by about 10%. And I found that using these types of studies and numbers is very convincing when we work with clients to try to make the case for these design interventions. And then COVID, this is Ontario, Canada data. They have two types of nursing homes. One is a 1972 standard grandfathered in, so four bedded open bays, large communal dining spaces versus 2015 standards of shared or private rooms and smaller decentralized stations for socializing and dining. If you are in one of those 1972 homes, your chance of dying from COVID is doubled. And that really made the government stop and say, wow, the building is hugely important in this case. And, you know, when people look for nursing homes for their families, they tend to look at the amount of care that's given per hour, per day, but not necessarily what type of building people are in. And so colleagues of mine from Europe, we wrote this article recently for a clinical journal, but I think it applies in this context of higher education as well. So we, we were concerned that what we're seeing with COVID with public buildings, public spaces, healthcare buildings, is to design in a reactive way to say we've got to react to COVID and design for infection control, negative pressure, decentralized spaces, flexible spaces. Some of that I think is appropriate, but we tried to make the case for building with resilience in mind and through a resilient building and space 
we can achieve pandemic preparedness and so much more. So we not only have to design to keep people in and infection out, but sometimes we need to get people out quickly in the event of um, emergencies or disasters, climate change is coming. And so I think resilience is key here, not necessarily designing for infection control. Next slide. And so in this article, we make the case for the smaller nursing home model of eight to 12 beds, which actually shows no COVID infection. There was a large study just a couple of weeks ago comparing these types of spaces. And I think these are important because we've thought about all stakeholders. We've thought about staff, we've thought about caregivers and having a space like this becomes flexible. We have many entrances for infection. We have many outdoor spaces. We can segregate staff. And so I think I put up this slide just to highlight the fact that design equity for all stakeholders, in this case, caregivers, residents and staff, this building meets those standards. Next slide. And then I think, you know, in medicine, we, we've had a lot of changes to our care models and the way we, we treat patients and the way we care for them. I would say we've had changes in education models as well. So how can the built environment adapt? This is an example of how our clinic rooms are changing. It's no longer the physician behind a big desk telling the patient what to do. We're a team and we present the information, but we work with patients and families to just come up with what they want to do. And so perhaps instead of the hierarchical desk, we need a round table setting where everybody is equal and per can participate. And I think that speaks to design equity and understanding education and care models need to work with the built environment to be the most successful. And I think that was my last slide, just some quick images and lessons from healthcare. Hopefully that was helpful and I'll pass it over to Paula. Hey, good afternoon. So the survey says that 70% of you are distracted on Zoom calls. So I hope we're all paying attention. <laughs> um, so a little bit just about, about me, next slide. So I work in health sciences and healthcare. Um, I've worked at a couple of great places with great people. Um, next slide this is my healthcare CV. And this is the room that I worked in. Um, it's the MICU. Um, and I, I show this slide just to say, hey, how do you in, take healthcare and education and put them together? So learning how to work in a room like this takes a lot of experiential learning and takes a lot of practice and really shows that in healthcare, we're lifelong learners because there's things changing. The photograph in the top right is where I grew up in Northern Ireland. And I have a picture of Marty Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, because I worked on a project for the military, studying military uh, health delivery for psychological, behavioral, and mental health. And he was a great proponent. So in healthcare, we're use, we use, we use a lot of integrated tools. And I, I know that in higher ed, you also have very specialized um, and student responsive uh, design guidelines. But in healthcare, we use the FGI guidelines since 1947. They are very, they are prescriptive on sizes of rooms and things and, and they're backed by evidence more and more. Every guideline set, the 2018 books have come that came out all have evidence based papers and references for our design decisions. I think that's something that higher ed can could use at times. Um, the FGI has already is already coming out in the next two months with an emergency conditions white paper. This is a response to COVID, but includes all disasters and hazards. And really, these emergency conditions are based on case studies, evidence-based papers from ASHI, ASHRAE, um, the AIA, and and uh, I think that there's a lot of things in that that will be applicable to to higher ed because they deal with um, public spaces and lobbies and high, the use outdoor spaces. Um, so some of you work, who work in higher ed, you maybe use your risk assessments, um, the shooter on campus, uh, disaster accidents maybe. So we use these a lot in healthcare and I think that they are very, very helpful to really in the times post COVID to be able to really look and see what could be applied that we know works in healthcare that we can apply to higher ed. 
So we have infection control risk assessments, uh, hospital acquired infection, hazard vulnerability assessments, those tools and little tables I find are handy when I'm working. I was working on Emory University School of Nursing recently, and um, I took some of the applications from those and applied them to the space programming for them. The next thing is the population. We look at, it's back a slide, thanks, Anisha. Um, you look at your population as student-centric, faculty-centric, staff-centric. Um, we look at population, obviously, and as Diana mentioned, our population are, is a huge range. We have seen the post-COVID, the COVID disparities in care. And in, as Diana mentioned, we really need to pay attention to anything we do that we really have, you know, um, we're aware of where the disparities. And to quote um, a favorite person of mine from MGB, if your idea doesn't, uh, doesn't address disparity, it's not an innovative idea. We have to bring things that are bringing more equity. Uh, we understand also the difference between rural and urban settings. So these emergency conditions guidelines will apply to small critical access hospitals with 20 beds to academic medical centers in urban settings. So there's a lot to learn to be responsive to your environment. And then the acuity, meaning that how acutely ill is the, is the person or the patient or their family. So I have a picture here of the worried well, and this is a fun journal to, to look at, the millennial mindset. So we have the worried well, and then we have the walking wounded. So we, we're looking, looking at how do you program spaces that's going to address all of your population for all the different things who they are. And then we have a lot of history. We have SARS-CoV-1 we learned a lot about, that's back in the avian flu 2003. Um, Ebola, which is back on the rise again in Western Africa. So we're, we're, we are using the kinds of experience and the studies and the evidence from those to really help inform what we're programming. The next slide. So our conditions, one of the things, this is how we've looked at it and I'm, I apply this in my programming um, in, in higher ed. What are the ideas that are gonna stick through COVID? There's still a lot, a lot of things we don't know, know enough about. Yes, we're studying air, ventilation, outside air, how much, what's better. We're looking at um, the flow of people, the portals, access, exit, exiting, one-way flows. How much is that working or not? And there's some really good research on that now. And We've done a lot of case studies. I hope, I'm hoping your higher ed prog projects, you can, you're going back, talking to clients, talking to find out what is it that worked for you during COVID? What really worked well and document it. I'm a big believer in documenting. So this is a 14 hospital system that we interviewed. They had 13,000 positive COVID patients across their system. 3,800 of them were inpatients and 17,000 uh, negative inpatients. There was not spread in this health system from these patients to the other patients. That's not where spread happened. And that is what we want to look at is why did that happen? What were the things that they instituted? They separated donning and doffing. They did a bunch of um, things and operationally that helped. Telemedicine and telehealth uh, probably everyone on this call has had some kind of tele televisit with their provider. Um, certainly, we saw the tremendous growth in that, the barriers. This, this all happened because the barriers and the obstacles that we've been talking about for 20 years, I would say, we've been talking about telemedicine, and we couldn't get over the hump of practitioners getting paid. <laughs> so, you know, simple things that operationally and really move, change the paradigm, really important. And the other thing we looked at is what about the staff? In higher ed, the people who clean the floors, who are making sure the public bathrooms are in good shape, who are feeding students, faculty, uh, the staff who are essentially essential workers for the campus, how are we taking care of them? 
And that gets some of that gets back to Diana's points, the aspects that she brought in. But certainly, where is their respite space? Where do they get a break? Uh, does it have a window? Um, and I just mentioned on my, because I think that I find these very useful um, in thinking about health on a campus with students. You know, Timely MD is a company that you know just got a month ago sixty million dollars more in investment. They already served Duke and Hopkins. Pre-COVID, ten percent of their telehealth for students, ten percent was mental health. Since COVID, sixty percent of all their visits and calls are our mental health, psychological health. Talkspace is another one that is widely used. Um, you'll see um, Michael Phelps, the swimmer, talking about how that helped him. These are all things that are part of this wellness program that you're putting together for students and, and faculty and staff on a campus. And again, this is just one part of it. I'll refer you also to the 2021 annual report from Penn State University that came out that taught 153 institutions, 800,000 visits that's talking about what they want need to do on campus for workload for providers in these spheres. And that is focusing universities. Yes, I think they were always, like we're in healthcare, we're patient centric. I used to say, when did we become patient centric? The day I became a student nurse, I was patient centric. That's not novel. But student centric and staff centric, what how does it translate into the wellness programs that you're putting together? Um, next slide. So our considerations in healthcare and on the health campus planning, outdoor spaces, have they never been more needed? It used to be the tables and picnic tables and umbrellas by Labor Day, they were gone from those spaces, but they're more important now. And we've witnessed how outdoor dining, outdoor programming for space. Some of you um, will under, know the Well Building Institute certification. They have an active exercise component to their building criteria. So you can use those types of things that we already have in place to really look at programming outdoor spaces, bocce courts, um, uh, anything that keep, gets people outside and gets us to use the outside space longer. Never mind what we know about outside air, the importance of outside air. Um, as I like to say, as my background says, it's more green and less screen time is our goal, right, for people. Um, I think there's a lot of more purposeful space programming. We, we rarely now in healthcare do soaring lobbies that that are, have a security desk and an information desk, really they're programmable spaces, really diving into that to say, what are all the activities we can use, COVID, post-COVID, and how, how, are, how are all of the, how's the flexibility or the one-way portals or the security going to work going forward? Uh, again, the population is, is something that um, I've mentioned. Uh, space is just part of the wellness program. Again, I refer you to the Well Building Guide Nourishment section that talks about smaller plates, sizes, to uh, all kinds of operational ways we can bring healthy attitudes and wellness to, to, to programs. Again, the Well Building Principles. And I'm a big proponent of RTLS, that's real-time locational sensing. It's something we've been using in healthcare for five years now. It has proved really, really useful in places that had it. So that's the sensing badge. Um, the little photograph down there shows when I'm working at Dana Farber, say, I can see if my nurse practitioner is three exam rooms down. I can see who's in the conference room. Uh, I, I can pull that up. I, I know where my patients are. Um, aside from the stuff in the hospital, things that are tagged, but really, people sensing. So how that helped is we could monitor, we could put our conference rooms and meeting spaces and say, there's now only 12 people to be in this instead of the 40 people going forward. And that monitors and tracks that kind of occupancy. And we can see we're compliant and we're paying attention to the 
the measures that we're putting in place. So an initial upfront cost, some wireless magic has to happen. But again, something that's really, um, really delivers on the measures and metrics that you can use for occupancy and, and tracking. And then documenting the evidence when the case studies are the best way I think of communicating when you're finding out just as Diana, when she sees a patient puts together uh, a comprehensive look at, at a person with them and their family. We're really looking at health systems and our university clients and finding out what did work, what were our assumptions and how are we going to use that going forward? Because there'll be another virus. It might it will maybe not be droplet. There'll be something else that we have to cope, cope with. And I think that's about it, so documenting the evidence. Yeah. I'm going to start uh, stop sharing my screen so we can start the conversation. Thanks, Anisha. Oh, Debbie, you have a point. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. No, I would leave that up for for uh, a little bit as as we transition. So I would invite uh, absolutely. Folks folks to ask questions. Um, I, I would like to ask a kind of overarching questions, uh, same to both of you, maybe starting with, with Diana. And that is, uh, well, first of all, thank you. Um, I, I often feel that when we're in higher ed, it is critically important for us to not just focus on what we know within higher ed, but reach outside our boundaries. I think Diana, Diana you touched on that sort of 80% of, of uh, learning happens outside of, of the spaces and I feel the same so reaching out to healthcare was something that that we thought would be really useful um, in addressing how we can create healthier buildings not just because of COVID but but with COVID as an impetus for us to think more thoughtfully about what we can do in our buildings and so I appreciate uh, thinking about both the mental and the physical well-being of the human beings that are occupying these spaces. So I would ask each of you, um, Diana first, if we were just going to do three things for the built environment um, in higher education, where would you think we should prioritize our efforts um, to improve the health of, of the buildings, knowing that some are very old, some are brand new, but what, what could campuses think about and prioritize if they were if they were thinking about making them more healthy? Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question, Debbie. So I'll take a stab and maybe Paula and I can do a joint effort here and think it out. And you know, I'd love to hear from the audience too if there are suggestions out there. I think getting it's hard to get a dialogue on these digital platforms, but we can try. Um, I think I'll say something that I say sometimes with healthcare and, you know, I think the question comes up, we have older buildings, we're planning new ones, what do we keep, what do we renovate, what do we do new? And I think I'll make a plug and say one of the top issues I see is the need to ask these research questions and figure out the answers. And I, I just want to stress the importance of conducting sort of a research type study in these types of spaces and really understanding how the environment is impacting people both from a physical and, and mental standpoint. And I think we can do that. I, he I hear a lot of the time, oh, you can't isolate the built environment in a research study. There's lots of confounding variables, people have health conditions, people are different. And there's ways you can design for that with, with good research uh, methodology. So I think if we have questions, we should be asking them and pushing to study them making sure that we have some of that data that I presented where we have the information to be able to base our decisions um, on, on evidence and credibility rather than what we think. Um, so that's one thing. So asking research questions and designing research studies. I think speaking to design equity, really drilling down to who the users are and what are their needs. And by users, I don't only mean the learners, but in healthcare, I think, you know, the pendulum has swung quite heavily towards patient experience and satisfaction. And we've in the process maybe forgotten about the staff and maybe given them sort of an afterthought in terms of space. And I, I don't know the education setting as well, but there are many other users than just the learners. So can we make sure that we prioritize everybody's wellness and everybody's experience? Um, and I think there's room for sort of user surveys and measuring user satisfaction and workflows. 
So that would be uh, an, another thought. And then I think just knowing what I know about how the world is changing in how healthcare, rethinking spaces and really trying to understand how the education model is going to marry up with the building design, just like that clinic room that I showed, how, how do we make sure that both can move in tandem and we're not designing something that in a few years is obsolete based on our education methods? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would just add to that, Debbie, I think that one of the things that we want to prioritize is we want to look at what isolation and privacy mean and getting together the spectrum of feeling on your own, being private, and then our social need to be connected with each other. And how are we going to put those spaces together in a way that's going to adapt for, a, for a, a, the next problem in healthcare that might be infectious in some way, or, or that's just resp more responsive to the environment. Um, I think the environment from the things that Diana mentioned, it's, and, and I, I, you know, you're very, in higher ed, you're very, you pay a lot of attention to the student experience and daylighting and lead goals and um, views and healthy systems, but also take a look at what, how durable are things going to be now? Think of all the cleaning products that have been used on materials and inside hot spaces. Are we gonna pay more attention to those? Are they going to be more, uh, is, is cleaning going to be seen? I call it, you know, I think it's gonna be seen and it's not gonna be off hours. We're looking to show people, we're taking care of you, we're cleaning during. Um, so I, I think that those are, um, also the use of um, robots and UV lights and cleaning and things like that. This is what we see in, in the hospital. I would say the prolonged use of the outdoor spaces. Um, I think we're going to see more classes taught outside just as what we've learned we can do. We've, we've been able to break down some of the barriers that used to prohibit those things. We're looking at putting in outdoor spaces, uh, areas and hospitals, infrastructure in the ground, power, electric, electricity, um, water even, um, and, and so that we can use the outdoor spaces more flexibly for the things that we use. And I can see that working in a, on a campus as well. I think you bring up an interesting point, Paul, and it's something that I really want to focus uh, the, the conversation on, and, and that is that we are dealing with a post-COVID, but what I think is that it has necessitated us thinking more broadly about things that we do and do them more purposefully, and both of you have talked about doing things purposefully. So outdoor spaces um, is, is perhaps... Um, thinking about it more broadly be, because of COVID, but, but we should have been thinking about these things already. Uh, you know, Diana gave the example of the uh, alto uh, tuberculosis uh, sanitariums, which were absolutely extraordinary at the time. And the idea of being outside as being a health solution <laughs> is pretty remarkable. But um, I think there's there's some of these things that, that you talk about um, that I, I wanted to go back to something that Diana was asking or, or mentioning, and that's the design equity. And you used a healthcare um, example. One of the things that I want to task us with as higher ed folks is equity. For us, it, it has to do with position, but it also has to do with race, uh, culture, background, and how we can incorporate these kinds of issues into buildings and make them more accessible. I don't know if either of you have, have any insight into um, in a healthcare setting, making well, making the buildings more accessible to all well, and something you can share with us. In well, I, I would say that the, the thing that's most not markedly notable to me is when you work with a university and you work with a community college, look at the differences we have in the so much of the population. Kids have three jobs, two jobs, they have a child, they have, they're changing in the car. Uh, they need, you know, they, um, and, and you're trying to think of how does your, how does your campus respond to people who are coming from different walks of life? 
what about the students? I mean, 13, I guess it's out of students who drop out, only 13% ever return to university. How are higher ed going to keep retain students? How are they going to bring them back? What are the kinds of things that make a campus online learning, hybrid learning, in-person lab work? What are the things that are going to make that change those dynamics? Yeah, no, that's that's great, Paula. Actually, those are some great thoughts. I think what we're trying to move towards, I think, in healthcare at least, is to come away from sort of design in two ways: design for many users and then design for disabilities. I think the concept of universal design has been yeah. really picking up, um, especially overseas, whereby you know whether you know space should be accessible to anyone and everyone, whether you're 92 and have a walker like many of my patients or you're two years old and taking your first steps or you're 32 and broke your ankle and have crutches for six weeks you know that all of those people should be able to access a space and i think approaching design with that in mind i have found to be helpful um, and the center for excellence in, in universal design overseas in dublin has some interesting materials on their website i found with some interesting graphics that can be helpful Um, thank you. I, I think also I, I wanted to explore a little bit um, something that that Paula mentioned, and it's kind of more detailed, but something that uh, Paula has has often said um, that healthcare uses data driven design, and they have I think earlier and more robustly than we in higher ed have have used data, although we're catching up, and and a lot of the design data-driven, evidence-driven is something that, that uh, our campus clients as stewards of a pretty large environments in some cases are very focused on. So I'm very curious about this RTLS um, that you've done, Paula, and where you might see that translating into value in higher education. Well, how many of us are programming classrooms and spaces and we really have no idea what the utilization is. We're told what the utilization is by enrollment. We can try and measure, but uh, RTLS would allow us, if your badge allowed you, I could see that out of a class of 80, who 30 showed up or 20 or eight showed up, I could understand better management of my space. That's like, for me, that's one basic, one basic uh, um, benefit of, of actually, tracking in real time what the occupancy is where and where people are going and really being able to then flex, you know, okay, so they, they'll put the lactation room in the lower bottom corner of the building out of the way or, or do they, and does it get used because people don't have time to go there? <laughs> so, we're, you know, understanding people's um, flow in a building and where they're frequenting is really, really help, really helpful. Um, I mean, RTLS was very resisted by physicians actually at the beginning because they didn't want people tracking them and knowing where they were. But I can tell you from my personal experience, seeing that in use, it didn't take four months before the benefits, they, people experienced the benefits. Well, one of the things that I can see um, with regard to that is years ago, I had a, a lab building and the client said to me, you know, we've got this, this lounge here and, and nobody uses it. And I looked at it and for me, it was clearly in the wrong place. But I'm thinking to myself, you know, if Debbie McDonald says, oh, your, your lounge is in the wrong place, that's why it's not working. <laughs> Now, there's some merit to that, but what, what is really great about having this data, like the RTLS data, or other sensing data, or you know whether it has to do with flow or occupancies or what, it will help clients understand things more quantitatively and be able to make better decisions about them. Um, and so I think that what you've done in, in healthcare and the, in the studies that, that uh, Diana referred to in terms of location, so now in case I'm ever in a critical ICU situation, I'll make sure I'm not in a corner room. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I think that it would help us those kinds of things really thinking because, you know, honestly, 
I think in higher ed that might translate to, you know, students that are sitting in the first first one or two or three rows actually are doing better than the ones that are sitting in the back. Um, you know, so I think location does have uh, some impact on things. Um, so that's that's kind of, um, I, I think it's, it's helpful for all of us that are attending to really think about how those kind of data-driven VRTLS, so just being thoughtful about where people are when and how many and how frequently is, a, is an important aspect to consider. I also wanted to think about a couple of things that uh, you mentioned. And one is I'm, I'm always very interested uh, in circadian rhythms and design and the impact of light on us. Both of you touched on that. Um, can you talk a little bit? I mean, you know, I, I am so happy to see FitWell, which we're actually going to see uh, some examples of in our case study, which is our third session, and well-being because I it, it it focuses on human comfort as opposed to just building operations and performance, which I think is is really critical. But if if each of you can talk about what your experiences are with the circadian rhythms with regard to health and healthcare, that might translate into better building design for higher ed. You want to go first, Paula? Oh no, you go. I have I have a strong opinion about this. <laughs> <laughs> I have strong opinions too, mostly in the in the healthcare space. As you can tell, I rarely get out of the hospital, so I'm I'm a little bit biased and tunnel vision when it comes to healthcare space. But you can all extrapolate, hopefully, some of these lessons. But you know that we are learning that light and access to daylight is is critical. For well-being and th th there's a condition called delirium which you may have seen in the news because covid is causing delirium in a lot of people which is really it's almost it's an acute brain failure it's an emergency people get confused they hallucinate we don't exactly know what happens what causes it we don't have any treatments we can support people through it but we know we can prevent it and if you look at the new england journal uh, review article on delirium and the algorithm for prevention Number one yeah. is maintaining circadian rhythms, maintaining, you know, especially in a critical care setting. Um, so I think we've done well in healthcare to think about patients and circadian rhythms. We've done less well thinking about other users like staff and how many staff lounges, at least in healthcare, maybe in higher ed, I don't know, are tucked away in the center of the building with absolutely no access to, to light. And I think when we think about staff retention and burnout, which has also come to light with COVID, natural light can be a huge uh, method to try to prevent some of this. So I, you know, it's it, it's hugely important to our health as as human beings. I think in the student sphere, it's hard having been a medical student and an architecture student, and I slept less in architecture than in medical school, in case you wanted to know. But flipping your circadian rhythms is also difficult. And how does the built environment respond since in academia, people are kind of going 24 seven um, is something to think about. Yeah. I disagree with Diana that having cared for patients who've got delirium in the ICU. I think it's very important in the critical care. I think if you're a patient going in for a knee replacement and you're in overnight, then you're you're good to go. We're not we're not going to be worried about your circadian rhythm. As long as we get you your pain med and get you up and moving, that's we'll be doing a good job. But um, but um, I think European countries have done a better job um, I would say, and including more technology, whether lighting systems in patient rooms than we have. I think in Europe, Paula, if I'm not mistaken, there are some minimum standards that, you know, staff yeah. in commercial office buildings have to be within a certain distance of access to a window that I don't necessarily see here in North America and Canada or the U.S. Right, exactly. So I'm curious then, uh, we, you both have talked about access to windows and it, it comes up a lot. Uh, and I am also interested before we get there, um, students and sleep, uh, Diana, you seem to be fine, uh, doing fine um, mm -hmm. <laughs> on outwardly anyway, uh, with, with well, little sleep. Well, you, you, you just don't see her huge sleep deficit. If there was a sleep deficit meter on her side of her photograph there, it probably <laughs> would be notable. So, so it is interesting to me, you know, we always understand how we beat up the residents and they don't get enough sleep, but, but I think the students, the same thing. And, and I'm curious what you might tell administrators 
uh, about students and sleep, or is it just a phase that people will go through while they're in college and get less sleep? Is that is that a healthy solution long term over four years, or do you see that that we could perhaps retool some of our learning environments to to approach that in a different way? I, I don't really have anything. I think sleep hygiene is is more talked about among students and helping them understand what screens can can do and concentrated efforts to create programs for them to to have a healthier waking hours. But um, having had five sons, I don't really know I could have changed any of their sleeping habits. <laughs> I think, no, I'd have to agree, sleep hygiene. And I think, you know, in the healthcare setting, maybe the, the provider can't get, you know, eight hours of sleep, even two hours while on a shift or working a 24 hour shift. But I think there's value to, to napping and to just rest in general, closing one's eyes, just even like Paula mentioned screens, just looking further off and having more depth to what you're looking at um, has value to your brain and your vision. So thinking about respite areas where somebody may not, in medicine, we don't even do these old fashioned call rooms with bunk beds because people are changing. The shifts are not 36, 48 hours anymore. But I think even if it's a 12 hour shift or a set of classes and study um, session, you still need times of rest. But even if it's just 10 or 15 minutes, there's value to those small periods of rest. So you both mentioned also um, mental access to mental health programs on campus. Uh, are there any particular models that you see as working um, on campus or any particular areas that you think uh, should be focused on more? We're seeing you know, new wellness building, for instance, um, popping up in, on different campuses. Well, I think that the, the effectiveness of online you know telehealth models is the evidence every month is increasingly how that facilitates access and, a, and numerous other metrics i think on campus the practitioners who are on campus seeing people in person are worried about their workload if their workload is high they can't see as many students referred or faculty and staff refer to them so there's concerns about that but i um so i think it is primarily about access and intervention what can you do and that's the same on a campus or in just in our everyday community living so do you think that the access for telehealth um mental health services uh can effectively replace much of the in-person mental health yeah. services on campuses yeah i think it's this the the stigma um is much reduced the barriers to getting care the cost of getting care the things that matter to people that um it's really remarkable and and it's it's not only in mental health obviously it's in in other um case management uh remotely patients being people being healthier um, and recovering quicker through the interventions that are coming remotely and device monitoring and things and the way um, you know programs that are right you know that you're documenting how you're feeling today and sending it in um, really providing your provider with more information more clinical information to be able to help you I think it's really good mm -hmm. It's certainly in, oh, sorry, Debbie, go ahead. go ahead. I guess just reflecting, uh, I it's been a huge transition to telehealth and telemedicine. I think it's fantastic. I think it'll never fully replace in-person visits for certain things, but I definitely think there's a place for telehealth and especially in the mental health uh, sector where um, you don't necessarily need to do a physical exam. It has a huge role to play. I imagine access would be a, you know, great for students. With my patient population in the in their 90s and 100s, they often have a barrier to technology. But in, in the campus world, I can imagine technology would be a huge enabler mm -hmm. rather than a barrier. Well, it's interesting to look. I mean, we have explored in the BSA SCUP sessions, but also just uh, nationally and internationally in higher ed, 
as a result of COVID, a lot of classes have gone online. And so we have a lot of technology that supports asynchronous um, yeah. learning that people can either just be online or even just look at a lecture at a different time of day if, if, if they feel like it or their schedule suggests. So it's intriguing to me to sort of think about, you know, 20, 50 years from now, when people look back on us, I think of COVID as a, as a great disruptor, but it has nudged, nudged us to do things that we already maybe should have been doing previously um, and are doing better now. Paula, you were lamenting that people were dragging their feet about telehealth uh, um, appointments. I think on both sides, I think there was some concern on the patient side that they wouldn't get the care um, that, right. that they would get in person. And I think the same thing for technology and classes in, in um, that people wouldn't get the same education or the same level of understanding. So it's interesting to look at that relationship and think 50 years from now, how it will be seen, I think, as a, a huge jump forward for us all as human beings to get used to this kind of interaction. Um, but at the same time, there's screen fatigue, there's the lack of personal interaction, and sometimes a lack of community. Um, what is your sense about this distancing that the technology is is creating for us? I think it, I think it's hard, and I, I think we're only starting in in medicine and healthcare to learn the effects of the distancing on people. We're doing a number of studies here in Boston to look at social isolation and what it's doing not only to people's mood and mental health, but also to cognition. And of course, again. My older population, but um, I worry about that. We don't necessarily know the brain effects of just distancing and less contact with humans. So I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried about it. Yeah, I, I think it's it's really um, actually I think it COVID. If anything, it it exposed the deplorable conditions we have in senior care and nursing home care, mm -hmm. staff, nursing home salaries. Um, and, and I think that that isolation and lack of stimulation, I think we're, we'll probably see through those studies that it has affected people. Not seeing, you know, and, and not being able to visit your 82 year old father who had a valve done last Friday for a week. Mm -hmm. I bet there's more delirium in the ICUs because the, his wife or his sister or his daughter wasn't there every day saying, hey, dad, how are you? You know, I mean, their screen is one thing, but I think in the isolation is will be exposed as not being a good thing. But even beyond long term care, Paula, I wonder, even as you know, mid career professionals who may not have families live alone, be working yeah. mostly for Zoom learners. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can imagine it would take a toll, and I don't know if we know yet what kind of toll that might be. Yeah, I'm sure That's everyone on this call has felt the, the drawbacks of isolation, not seeing grandchildren, not seeing friends. You know, um, Zoom happy hours are all well and good. <laughs> but, but. So well, it's, it's almost, oh, go ahead, Neosha. I was gonna to mention to Debbie's point, I feel like the um, module of learning is not the traditional learning anymore. We are experiencing a huge shift in learning. And mm. to Paolo's point, um, the students are also not uh, traditional students anymore. Many of them are working, many of them are mm. having uh, side activities. Like uh, it's not the typical just sitting at the class and walking to lab and just being, um, within the dorm space. Now uh, the students are experiencing a whole different lifestyle. And uh, to your point, um, I think all of you are confirming through this conversation that higher education design, uh, the buildings cannot uh, remain the same traditional buildings anymore either. Uh, otherwise mm -hmm. it would become that slide that Diana was sharing that um, there is a path, but students will go another path. Uh, so. It's very amazing to listen to all of this information. Right, and I want to I want to thank you. I don't know if you have each a sentence or two. If there's something else that you wanted to to mention to our group in, in closing. No, but thank you. All right. Yeah, um, thank you, everybody. This was great.
Yeah, and I what I want to sort of leave us with is sometimes we don't have the answers, but you brought up really, really good questions. And I think the social isolation issue uh, is something that we do need to think about in higher education moving forward, how we maintain that sense of community while we take advantage of the robust technology that we've all learned to use so well um, and how we can sort of maintain a sort of a mental health balance of, of progress with that at the same time while we are um, well aware of some of the down, downsides to it. So I want to thank you, Paula Gluick and Diana Anderson. Um, and for this session, we will have about a 15 minute break and then at 2.45, we will explore healthy buildings from an engineering perspective. Uh, so we'll have folks from um, your at Apple. 140, 1.45. I'm sorry, 1.45, yeah. what did I say? That's so okay. 1.45. Uh, from Bureau Heppold and from uh, BR Plus A, and then uh, Patrick Murphy, who's a committee member, will moderate from Vanderweil. So appreciate it. Everybody take a break, and we hope you all come back for the engineering perspective. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you.